Morning, Dee. In the nick of time. <laughs> right on time. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wonderful. And you got the agenda? I'm ready. Sweet. Great. I'll, I'll um, screen share when the, when the time's right, too. I have my uh, PDF copy up here. Okay. Good morning, everybody, whoever you are out there. <laughs> I see some, some names. <clears throat> I'm just looking over the agenda and the times that I wrote are very loose. I didn't update them from the last time. So but I think we're, we're generally, I think it, it counts for like uh, just under two hours. So anyway. If you, don't, don't worry about those times too much, Dee. Okay. We Hi, will... Mary. Nice to have you. Thanks for coming again. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm dealing with a minor household emergency, so I might not be able to be on video, but I will be trying to listen as much as I can. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. We'll... Um... We'll wait just a few more minutes to get some folks on here. Hi, everybody. Hey, yeah. Hi, Ron. How's it going? Good. I can't make it to to our evening get together. No worries. No worries. <laughs> How's everything with the rain up there? Oh, it's been great. We we got here in Sebastopol, we got about three, four inches so far. Yeah, right. It's been a while. Yeah. The vernal pools are full out in the flats out here. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can hear frogs for the first time in three oh, years. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> really good signs, good signs. Um, let's see. You know what? I think we'll start and do a quick um, introductions. And did Kim get on here? I thought I saw him. Anyway, well, Kim, he, he know yeah. that um, he's going to be in briefly and then has another meeting he has to attend. Right, so as soon as we see him after our introductions, um, th then we'll uh, um, have Kim uh, say his piece. So remind me, are we going to introduce ourselves and then do our little, um, you know, what's the most important things happening this last month? Or we, is that how we usually do it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You can go first, Dee, and then we'll just go around the um, around the screen. You can you can just call people off as you see them on your screen. Yeah, I'm going to start with uh, Jeannie Chin. I just saw her yesterday. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so, you know, it's really nice that it's not fire season. Um, and and so people are, are more relaxed right now. Um, we're going to have our um, our, our uh, city coordinator for emergency services up in Ukiah join us for another presentation, not at the January meeting, but the following one uh, for earthquakes. Um, so that'll be really interesting. The last one, he gave us a presentation in, um, in November on um, emergency services and lots of questions and it, it was really good. And we're, we're coming along, everybody's getting the reflective signage and, and the poles. And we, we'll, we have like a whole road group of people at a time um, that we're servicing for them. So uh, in an emergency situation, uh, CAL FIRE and other emergency vehicles will easily be able to know where they are. And we're just finishing. We have just a little bit of money left on our veg management plan to work on a road way back up in the hills. That's pretty much it that's going on with that. Um, in the Sierra Club group, um, the Forest Committee, uh, there are a number of current um, 
uh, projects going on. Uh, several <laughs> are related to PG&E and the um, taking down of, of old growth redwoods and, and other trees that are outside of their right of way. And um, so anyway, we're continuing the fight with that. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Jeannie. How about Ron? Um, well, the uh, Sonoma RCD met uh, last week and we we did our audit and passed and uh, uh, <laughs> the money for the work in Gualala is not released, but the project's okay. So uh, we'll see what happens. I know we're doing a few uh, water catchers and I think we're gonna to have to go out and reevaluate each project, you know, after this rain and see where we stand on. Or, but we seem to be moving along on schedule, so. Great. Okay, how about Brooke? Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, Brooke Edwards, Park Program Supervisor with uh, Sonoma County Regional Parks. And uh, really the new thing that we're working on is I'm working on putting together a vegetation treatment plan for uh, Foothill and Shiloh Regional Parks. And so those are the two parks that are kind of east of Windsor and uh, they were hit by uh, Tubbs and Kincaid. So we're going through that Cal VTP process. If there's anyone else going through the same process, I'll be reaching out to you to to get some ideas on some of the challenges, but uh, hopefully once I get through that process, I can be a, a resource for others that uh, are gonna go through that BTP process. And that's it. Okay. Um, Ms. Ellie. Oh, hi. Um, well, Sonoma Ecology Center, I, I think most of you saw Caitlin put out a request for working together on a Coastal Conservancy grant funding source and, and we've gotten a, an outstanding number of positive responses. Um, so if anybody is still interested in uh, looking at this, it's a wildfire resilience grant program for uh, on the ground work for public and um, protected properties. So it's um, if anybody is interested and hasn't gotten back to Caitlin, go ahead and do that. And then um, we just, um, gave a presentation, Brock Dolman and, and Mike Jones, Mike Jones of UC Cooperative Extension did the best practices for uh, wildfire uh, resiliency and natural resource preservation uh, last Monday for a, a group of West County people and um, Snowman Snow Ecology Center coordinated it. And it was fascinating, uh, 197 people signed up and about 90 people attended. And I'm assuming that the many of the rest of them will actually look at look at the recording that we did. So there's obviously a lot of interest in that subject. And so Brock at OAEC and the Sonoma Ecology Center and um, Brianna Boaz of the JC are working together to, to do a uh, more of a field workshop, not not a work workshop, but but more of a um, educational workshop for landowners uh, on the same subject. And we're, we have some funding potentially from the uh, Fire Safe Sonoma. And so we're just putting that together as fast as we can. And it's really great working with those guys. And I'm thinking that maybe the RCDs and others may want to contribute to that, that subject. Um, hey, Ellie, I had a question for you. Sorry to ahead. jump in. Uh, I was just wondering, what's the focus of, uh, uh, for that grant that Caitlin's going after? Is there particular properties, uh, particular practices that you guys are looking at? Let me, let me see. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going back to her original email to everyone. Um, do you want to partner with Sonoma Ecology Center on a grant proposal for on the ground fire resilience work? Uh, I can forward this to you, Brooke. Um, mm -hmm. There's a grant program that looks like a good fit for our fire related on the ground work, Coastal Conservancy Wildfire Resilience Program website I can um, put in the chat. Um, only public and protected lands can get this funding. The proposal is due January 14th. Okay, Thanks. that's very, very good. Um, Ellie, is the recording available of that um, presentation? It is available and it's on the um, Fire Safe Sonoma 
uh, YouTube link. Um, Is there a way for you to put that in the chat? Yeah. Yeah. I'll go find that. And put okay, it that would be terrific because I missed it and I really would like to have, um, you know, like the information and uh, support um, the work there. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Peter Lacourt. Uh, good morning, everyone. Peter Lacourt here. I'm the force manager for Pacific Union College here in Napa County. So I'm a neighbor of you guys, and I'm also on the board of Napa County Firewise. Uh, the most exciting thing happening in my world right now, I've got a really big mastication project happening on my land that's been going on for months now. It's about 250 acre project with a $1.1 million budget. The Napa Communities Firewise Foundation funded about 850,000 of that, but I've almost gone through that funding. And now I'm actually going to some funding that the Napa RCD hooked me up with, which is through that Coastal Conservancy grant that was just being mentioned. So I'm actually getting in on a little bit of that funding myself. And then when that dries up, I'm going to have some NRCS funding. So I'm putting together about $1.1 million in a project this year with a combination of different sources. And as a land manager, I'm finding that's really the winning strategy is not just focusing on any one funding source, but you got to cast a wide net and kind of see what comes into you. So having some good victories finally. And yeah, it's a really exciting project that I'll be presenting on in March. And I think we're actually going to do a field trip here to the PUC Forest in March. So I look forward to uh, sharing my work with you guys at that time. Yes, that's we're, about looking, what I got. We're, we're looking forward to it, too. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Judy. Okay, we have a, we have a, a number of things going on right now. <clears throat> I think one of the most important ones uh, is the uh, collaborative work that we're doing along the Sonoma Coast. Um, Ellie, one of the things that we're going to be talking about tomorrow also is that Coastal Conservancy grant. We're looking more. We're uh, we're not looking at public and protected properties. We are looking at. Um, using that for evacuation routes along the north coast here and so i'm going to attend that meeting this afternoon and look but i was you know i had been thinking um if there might be a way that um our different groups because we're doing different things could still somehow partner on a uh, like a block grant or something in sonoma county to the coastal conservancy for this money because we're doing different work here on the coast. Um, and so it's something that I thought I would, uh, after this meeting today, um, talk to Caitlin about and how we might be able to collaborate um, throughout this county on that grant. Uh, one of the things we did a few weeks ago, well, in November, we had a, um, a collaborative meeting with all of our uh, communities from actually uh, the Jenner Headlands, though Brooke, uh, Luke couldn't make it for uh, the Jenner Headlands, but we had the Muniz Ranches and then all the fire districts from Casadero, Fort Ross, and then the um, North Sonoma Coast and the communities in those areas meet. And we met with Marshall to look at the next CAL FIRE grant and how to prioritize our projects and um, how, to, how to approach this spending and looking at potential um, funds for other projects. And then do we focus on the ridge lines? Do we focus on the evacuation routes? You know, there are a lot of things to look at and our needs are very different. Um, so uh, a lot came out of that. Uh, and part of that, a, a good piece of that was partnering with uh, Sonoma North Coast Fire District and working with, uh, with her on bringing in the Sea Ranch, Kashaya, Annapolis. Uh, we already have uh, Timber Cove all the way up the coast uh, to Minas Ranches. So that was a very big project for us. Um, we have a, a wonderful person out here. I don't know if you're familiar with the Cass Hills Fire Emergency page, uh, a, a man by the name of Damien uh, Bonet who set that up. And he set up a group page for our projects and grant group as well. Um, so if anyone is interested, uh, that's just getting set up right now. Uh, email me if you wanna be a part of that group or for what's going on here on the North Coast as far as fire, um, planning and um, grant planning as well. 
Another thing we just did, we just finished out our closed, our uh, rainwater catchment grant with the Sonoma RCD. Um, that's coming, that just came to an end. Uh, we just are finishing that final report. They're finishing the final report. I just send in my information. So that was another good project. That's our second rainwater catchment project here on the coast with over a half million gallons of water savings wow. in our watersheds, uh, in our coastal watersheds from uh, the Wallala River and um, Russian Gulch, Austin Creek. So that's something we all feel very good about. Um, and we got our chipper and um, that was exciting. We're starting our no cost chipper program. And thank you, Kim, for all your help. And um, we finally figured out how to make it work, how uh, we can work with our, uh, you know, a private contractor who is one of our fire department um, members, he's one of our community forest members. He's been in this community his whole life. And um, we're just dotting our I's and crossing our T's on our uh, contract agreement with him. Uh, and we figured out a plan, it, you know, and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. <laughs> this, yeah, I want that thing running 24 seven now. Come on now. I know. <laughs> well, people yeah, are working like at that. People are lined up and we have enough money right now. We've raised some money. We have some money to get that program started. We're still trying to raise about $20,000. We'll be looking at some smaller grants and some uh, individual fundraising um, for that program, but um, it's ready. And so we're gonna kick it off after January 1st. And now we're moving into our Fort Ross Road project. And I know, um, Matt Green has been talking to Robert, uh, has been in touch with him. He's had some family issues that he had to deal with for a few weeks there. And, um, but we have a timeline for that. We have a project schedule ready to go. Uh, and we're looking forward to uh, getting started with that um, Sonoma County Vegetation Management PG&E Settlement Fund Grant Project. And uh, we're all excited about that. So on that, uh, and we have a number of other things, but those are the big things that are going on right now. And um, <clears throat> we're motivated here on the coast. We're motivated <laughs> yeah. to get moving. We're motivated on our grant projects. We're motivated um, on a lot of things and it feels good. So um, it, it feels good to all of us to know that, uh, you know, so much is going on, Judy, over the years. It's just been um, snowballing uh, the amount of, um, uh, amount of the forest work that you're able to not only get money for, but implement. It's fantastic. Uh, Kim Batchelder, please. Great. Uh, good morning. Yeah, Judy, that's really exciting to hear. You guys are always uh, knocking out of the park. And um, it's just such a flagship project for the Sonoma County Working Group as far as watching this thing uh, be born so many years ago. And then moving into such great work. So thank you very much for all the work yeah, you guys do. Um, so I am uh, here to uh, announce that we are officially launching the 2022 uh, grant cycle for the next round of Sonoma County's uh, vegetation management uh, grant program. Uh, it's launching today, right this moment. So you're welcome. I'll send you guys a link to uh, the uh, website, our website where all the information will be housed. Uh, it's a similar format as uh, last year, but I'm really excited about the changes that we've uh, uh, implemented uh, for this round. I think um, as, because I, I came in relatively late to the program, um, starting in September officially, but helping most of the groups get their grant agreements signed but I wasn't part of the selection team in the first round. So um, after doing some uh, pretty thorough analysis and uh, getting out on the field and seeing projects uh, in their implementation phase, I started to see some uh, trends that I really was hoping to change or move in a different direction. And that is trying to look at a little bit more larger scale efforts to try to think about things that weren't on the scale of annual maintenance level projects, but rather larger scale uh, efforts on, on the level of what um, Jenner Headlands and uh, the Upper Mark West groups are doing, thinking about um, 
how to do shaded fuel breaks that really make an impact and will protect a community on the lower elevation. So um, I'm really proud of what we've done with the grants so far, uh, but I hope this next generation will be uh, taking that and moving it further down that sustainability um, perspective. Um, I really think there's opportunities to blend both um, fire uh, or community safety and uh, fire resilience with sound ecological practices. I'm not I'm knocking any single project that we supported the last round, but I really think that will be a, um, a parameter or a criteria that we will be looking at for this next round. So I'm excited to see what, uh, what comes about. Um, we have up to $4 million approved by the board for this grant cycle. So that's significant amount of money. And we will hopefully be able to um, support a number of different projects throughout. Uh, one other really uh, fascinating advancement that I think we've made in this round is that we will be relying on the uh, Sonoma County uh, Community Wild uh, Fire Protection Plan tool called the Project Ranking Tool as one of our first screens to projects. And so this has multiple benefits. For one, it allows us to get these projects on the map. Uh, the CWPP for the county uh, allows, this tool will have those projects automatically updated onto their uh, map of projects throughout the county. The other factor is that it helps us to be as transparent as possible. We understand where the proximity of these projects to uh, fire threats across the county how those uh, projects intend to address everything from uh, defensible space to shaded fuel breaks to uh, understory uh, fuel management to invasive plants. All those are part of the uh, CWPP project ranking tool that we will have a special portal where uh, all the applications will have to uh, fill that, um, that survey out and place the project on the map and that will help um, uh, Carleone and Esther from FireSafe Sonoma uh, to uh, load those projects up. So even if they do not qualify for uh, grants in this cycle, uh, they will be listed on the CWPP as a project that could be fundable, okay? So I think that's a really valuable um, contribution to this next round of grants. So. Uh, I know we have a lot of other people that want to speak, so I just wanted to kind of share that exciting news and, um, and more information to follow. Oh, uh, the last thing I'll end on is that we have two workshops scheduled for January 5th and uh, January 13th. And so those workshops will be specific to how to uh, apply, answer any questions. We want people to really dive into the website now so they can really understand what the application requires. Uh, and uh, to manage the CWP or the, uh, the project ranking tool. And then uh, we'll be able to answer more questions um, in January once people have had the chance to digest what the criteria will be, okay? And I won't take questions now because I know everybody's like chomping at the bit, but just go to the website, folks. <laughs> so thanks very much, I appreciate it. You're muted. Hey, Dee, I think you're still muted. Uh, we're, we're hearing uh, somebody. Okay, we are both welcome in the <laughs> We're hearing on somebody's behalf, conversation. If you can check to see if it's you, it'd be great. Let's go. So, Lynn. Elizabeth, I think you should. Good morning. Uh, um, things are, are moving along up here in the Upper Marquest watershed. Um, are you ready? There is an interference, and I don't know where that's coming from. But. Okay. So welcome, everyone, to Beyond Defensible Space. Um, <laughs> good evening. Oh, um, someone yeah, I think is that's playing you. that video. Oh, you know what? Safe for West County. Safe for West County. Like is me, me, but it's not me. Somebody is me somewhere else, disembodied. Um, make there sure we go. I'm not. That's not me. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was maybe Dee's video was playing in the background without um, her doing it. So we're all good. Um, so Upper Mark West 
watershed on a community level. Um, there are two projects that Sonoma RCD is leading up here that were funded through the Sonoma County Vegetation Management Program. One is doing 100 foot defensible space around 55 homes in a community up here that's uh, very high danger. And the other is the maintenance of a fire break that was real instrumental um, to saving homes in the glass fire. And both of those projects have started and they're working hard to um, get those done. So thank you for the funding and thank you for the help on that. It's, it's in progress. Um, the other thing up here is that the Upper Mark West Fire Safe Council is meeting next week. We are, as Kim suggested, looking at some larger scale efforts that um, we would like to be our next steps. And we're starting to map those out and reach out to landowners to get them involved and to um, get them on board. So that's kind of where the Fire Safe Council is headed. And then um, on a personal level, what I see up here is that everything is very much different since we've had some rain, which is wonderful and a little bit scary. Um, we've had a few mudslides. Um, my property and a large property next door benefited from a grant that did culvert and road work. And that culvert and road work was finished just before the big rain in October. So we're looking at it every morning. I just got and walking that loop and um, the road work looks good and the culverts are great. So that's real encouraging. And, but it, it was a little frightening to have soft roads and big rains come within a couple of weeks of each other. And then um, of course it's burn pile season. So we're doing burn piles and having burn parties and um, having a lot of fun with that. So it's beautiful up here. The sun is out today and it's just absolutely gorgeous. Okay, great. And D, you are on mute again. <laughs> um, Carleone, you want to say a few words, please? Good morning, everybody. I, I'm, I'm with Lynn on the... Boy, it's nice to see the sunshine. I love that rain. No complaints, but... So um, I wanted to give you guys a quick update on the CWPP and where we're at with that. Um, the first draft is drafted. And um, what we've been doing for the last week is sending that out to the board and the board of supervisors and <clears throat> Cal Father and other folks for our first round of comments. It'll go out to our steering committee, um, I think this week sometime or early next week. And after that, um, we're going to incorporate any changes we get from the steering and the board and those folks, and then we'll um, be presenting it out for public view. Um, we have a series of uh, meetings planned for that public review in January, starting on the 13th, thanks to the 13th to 19th. I'll paste those uh, dates in. What we're doing is we're allowing the board, we're doing them by supervisor district. So what we said is first come first serve, you pick a date from this list and that's when your district meeting will be. So we're not sure um, which date we'll have whose uh, meetings yet, we'll post those on the website. Um, the draft looks great. I really encourage you to um, pop into the hub site and play around in there. It's an awesome, awesome tool. You can go in there, you can make a project that's just, you don't have to use the ranking tool. You can just go and go, I was going to do a project here. How many people are there? What's the fire hazard severity zone average? What's the, it's super fun. So um, hop into the hub site for the CWPP, play around with the mapping. Um, and what I'd really, really like to encourage is for more people to enter their projects um, into the overall map for the county. Um, a lot of folks haven't done that yet. And um, it's not that hard to do. Um, it's uh, that there's pretty clear instructions. It's the once you figure out where the tool is to drive the polygon, it's 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 really not that hard. It's a little time consuming, but I think we really need to have the central you know depository for all of this um, grant information to go. 
I will frankly admit that I haven't put in my project areas for my grants yet either. So I do understand um, what's going on, but I've got to get in and um, pop those in for permits and OMAS projects um, as soon as I can. But um, we're pretty excited about the outcome of the CWPP. Um, more than happy to take um, suggestions for that. Um, those of you on the steering committee and there's some of you here, we'll get um, that draft soon. Um, and we will endeavor to give you as much time as you can to make changes. We're probably gonna have the uh, revision period open until sometime in February. Um, we've been thinking of presenting it to the board on Wildfire Prevention Week in May, but we're waffling on that date. We're not exactly sure when it's gonna be. Um, but really go to the hub, bang around, have fun. It's a super fun tool. Most of can the really fun stuff is in the top row. Can I ask? Um... Because I know we've been saying for months that we should enter our projects, and some sometimes we have time for it, and sometimes we uh, just put it on tomorrow's list of to dos. Um, always tomorrow. And um, so I was thinking, is there a deadline? Because deadlines are pretty motivating. There is a deadline, and um, it is I think February twenty eighth, as I recall. Um, it's on the it's on the hook. Um, because we really need to have a stop date. And I'm pretty sure that's February 28th, but it's, it's there on the hub site. We need to have a stop date so that we can stop and then regroup and then come back in. Um, and we're really um, thinking that Farsay Sonoma is probably gonna take over that aspect of this project in the future. So they'll be the ones um, sort of putting out the outreach to the communities to have people enter their projects, vet, do an initial vetting on the projects to make sure they're real projects that people have entered, stuff like that, and then maintain that. And, we'll pro and they will be in charge of coordinating either annual or biannual twice a year meetings to sort of look at the projects people want, get them up. Because it really helps people think about like what's in this area, what projects could we combine these two projects into one project and have better impact and better chance for funding. Um, and all that. And the really cool thing is our project ranking tool, the entry tool, um, um, the open space district has adopted that tool to use for the PG&E grant funding this year. Um, so people will be also using the tool, the o OSD has their own version on, this, on their site. And what we'll do is we'll take the top 35 projects and push them back into the CWPP, so not all the funded projects, but all the top ranked projects um, can end up, can be on the map for um, as long as we want them. Then when we have those yearly update meetings, that'll be, do you still want to do this project? Have you sought other funding? And we'll sort of change the status of the projects according to what people say. So it's uh, pretty exciting. And we're, we're pretty happy about it, so. Um, um, Carleone, will you, uh, the one, the projects that aren't in the top 35, will you still have them on file? Are they still, so that they can still make, uh, make the list at some point? That would be up to the open space district. I won't even see those. Yeah. So I think, um, we have been talking with, uh, uh, Esther, Fire Safe Sonoma, and we, we've, um, thought about, uh, let's look at all the projects and how if we, because um, it is creating a database, it's very rich. And so um, we'll have a report of all the projects with all their data. And that was one of the big upsides that Carleone and I discussed is like, wow, we're having all these folks enter their data and we'll be doing a filter of all these projects. It really does make sense to insert those into the a project um, uh, the project list for the CWPP. The drawback is if they're really, if the project doesn't really uh, have anything to do with either, like for instance, we got some pretty interesting proposals last round, including a sign that advertised thanking uh, the um, firefighters, which is very noble, but it doesn't really uh, help us to move in a uh, in the direction we want to go. So that's kind of what we, I think there's going to be a look at all the projects and determine what are viable projects that really make sense to put on the project list. And, and people, again, this is uh, completely transparent with the CWPP. Anybody who wants to put a project in the CWPP is welcome to do so. This is just a, a, by going through the special portal that we'll have 
with the uh, vegetation management grant program, this is just another opportunity to get more projects loaded up onto the uh, CWPP, but to go through another process by which we're do being more selective uh, who would actually qualify for grants okay, under so the uh, vegetation management grant. So all the projects that uh, they've been submitted to the CWPP will go into the CWPP, but they won't be on this ranked list. Is that correct? Through the vegetation management grant program, that's going to be a separate portal uh, that we will take the data once we get it, uh, filter it through to make sure the projects are all legit, that we would then pull back into the CWPP project list. That's something that Carly and Owen and I will do once we understand what types of projects we're getting. Our initial thought was that maybe we take the top third, those are the projects that really have potential for funding, if not within the vegetation management grant program, but for other cal fire sources. But thinking through it really makes a lot of sense that people are taking the effort and making the effort to enter this data in. So let's maybe take advantage of that and, and plug it into the CWPP. So I didn't understand. So not all projects that are submitting now to the CWPP will go into the CWPP. Um, so let me just back up a little bit, uh, and I'm sorry this is taking too much time, but um, what we've agreed with uh, the CWPP uh, folks, uh, Carleone and uh, FireSafe Sonoma, is that we create a special portal um, that has the ranking tool as part of our uh, grant selection process. And so that's exactly the same survey that everybody would do to enter their project into the countywide CWPP. But it's a special portal because those are applicants for a grant, i.e. Okay. the Vegetation okay. Management Grant Program. Okay. Those are in a separate pool now. We don't have them mixed up with the big list of project list that um, Carvion and Fire Safety Sonoma manage now. So the difference is that we will um, we have all that data that we will then work with um, Fire Safe Sonoma to bring back in as projects for the larger countywide CWPP project list. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, and just to differentiate our portal um, survey does add additional questions that are specific to the grant qualification. So we address, I think, um, uh, we have a couple of questions on uh, biodiversity. Is that being included in your proposal in your project proposal. Um, I think there's a question about, um, uh, are you serving any vulnerable communities? So uh, looking at um, materials that are bilingual or trilingual, uh, things like that. So those are additional questions that we think add value to us as the grant selection team, but those won't be included in uh, what the CWPP on a county scale are looking at. Okay, Derek, thank you so much. Right, and so Carly Own, did you have anything more? Well, I was just going to add that um, that's one of the reasons we're so excited about sharing the tool with the OSD yeah. Yeah. for this project is that um, tweaking the way that list works is great. So we may well end up incorporating some of the things that they've added onto our version at some point because you know this is a um, this is a new tool. This um, We originally got the idea for this, Roberta McIntyre and I, from a, a tool that Modoc County had done, and we adapted and changed it for the 2016 CWPP. And then we did extensive revisions in this version, but it's still not something that other people have done before. Um, so we're making it up as we go along. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're really hoping for changes to that tool as time goes by. Okay. And that's one of the reasons I'm really glad that Kim's using it because we'll see you yeah. know, what's up with what. And we don't expect it to be static. That's the beauty of the hub site on the CWPP, especially the CWPP exists as a document, but it really also exists on the hub site and the hub site can be changed and uh, moved around over time which makes it a much more um, vibrant, up-to-date document as opposed to something that you wrote five years ago and is Static, yeah, still yeah. sitting there in five years, which the plan in order to modify the actual CWPP, you have to go through the whole collaborative process, but to modify the hub and the, the, period, the um, 
items in the appendices, you don't. So okay. we're relying a lot on those. We'll be adding other things. There's the potential operational delineation system, which is coming up, which is a really awesome tool to look at um, the functionality of projects, how, how well a project is gonna actually work to reduce risk. Um, and so we're starting to work on that with the uh, um, resource conservation partnership folks. Um, and I think that somehow we'll have to morph that into the appendices and onto the website as that develops. But um, as tools are developed, we will incorporate them into the hub site and or the CWPP whenever that. Carol Leon, could you say that that last tool that you're going to you're developing with the resource resource districts? We're not developing it. It's been developed by the Forest Service and uh, Oregon State and all kinds of um, awesome brains. It's called Potential Operational Delineations or Pods, the pod system. And it basically sort of takes um, all the values, throws them into a model that helps you to look at, okay, where are the ridge tops? Here's a ridge top, but is it gonna function to protect this community where the identified values are this, this, and this? So if we do this project here, is it accessible? Are we going to be able to get there? Is it going to work? And it's just a, a really intensive model that um, was just introduced. We just had a meeting last week about it. Um, and it, it's come in this way. I think it's going to be a very, very helpful tool um, as time moves forward. And it's a much larger than Sonoma County project. It's nationwide. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carleone. We look forward to uh, taking all the next steps. Uh, how about Ryan Klausch? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, you got it. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ryan Klausch. I'm the Wildland, Wildland Fuels Project Coordinator, mouthful, for the Conservation Fund. Um, I'm actually here because Brooke convinced me that I should show up. Um, we have about 19,000 acres in Northwest Sonoma. It's known as the Buckeye Forest. Some of you might recognize it as the Preservation Ranch. Um, and right now I'm working on about a 4,000 acre project out there, primarily with prescribed fire, but including some shaded fuel breaks and trying to figure out some landscape scale fuels management and returning fire regimes back to the forest. So it's my big project right now, we're doing VTP right now. So Brooke, I'm sure we'll be talking. <laughs> um, mine's just on a pretty big scale. I don't know how many acres you're going for, but um, working with Cal Fire, because in terms of liability, we're going to have to use Cal Fire to, to be the burn boss and to be implementing the burns until our, um, our upper management is more comfortable with uh, kind of a mixed risk and, um, and liability situation. But that's what we're working on. Happy to okay. be here. I did, did I interrupt you? Are you done? I'm done. Okay, great. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I had a quick question for Ryan, though. Okay. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that uh, when I talked to Ryan, it, apparently they're they're working at a landscape level. They're thinking about putting in some large prescribed burns. Ryan, can you just mention maybe to the group, uh, you know, how much acreage per year? You know, once you have everything online and you're actually going to put fire on the ground, how many acres a year are you trying to do prescribed fire on? So I think that. The initial goal is to get to 500 acres per year. Um, I think that's that's kind of on a on a low number. Um, I think to really treat all of our acres in a reasonable amount of time, we'd have to do even more. But we have 72,000 acres between Sonoma County and Mendocino County, so that'd be a lot of acreage to burn, and would probably require a lot more resources, a lot more staff. So we're going to start with 500. I think that's reasonable. And this will be kind of a demonstration for us in terms of, is this, is this even feasible? Is this something we can do on a landscape scale? And what do we need? And, and I'm, I'm hoping to get to the point where, you know, Cal Fire likes dozer lines. They like dozer lines as control lines, but putting a dozer line in every ridge on our property, I mean, that's not my goal. I don't think that's the ecological goal, but getting to the point where we can start doing burns with wet lines or lines that are, are less, um, more than just bare mineral soil, I think is the goal, starting to use creeks, other things that we can do to, to eventually have it be where we can burn places without having to dig up the soil every single time. 
Yeah, so this is a really exciting project and uh, I look forward to see how you guys implement it. You know, Marshall Tuberville, Ben Nichols over at CAL FIRE, they're all talking about ramping up and really burning uh, a lot more acres, not just in a shaded fuel break, but, but even off of that. And I think you mentioned one term like pyro silviculture, where at some point, hopefully we'll be able to use prescribed fire really as a way of, of managing a, a whole forest stand instead of just shaded fuel break. So really excited to see how this moves forward. And I think we'll all be watching and hopefully we can follow with uh, your lead on this. I, I think it's really important for Sonoma County because to my knowledge, Sonoma County is one of the most parcelized counties in the state, yep. if not be. So having a unit of consolidated thousands of acres gives us a good opportunity to try it with a little bit less complexity because we own most of that acreage. So hopefully that will- Sonoma, Sonoma County has 17,000 different forest parcels, just yeah. for your information. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question? Uh, are you going to be at the Guala River Watershed Council meeting next Tuesday? I don't know. If, I'm I'm not, but I don't know if we're going to have a representative there. I know Scott Kelly has been usually the person who represents us, or maybe Blake Tallman. But if yeah. if you're needing a representative from the Conservation Fund there, if you could send me some information about it, that would be okay. nice. Yeah, Jill is Jill here. She sent out a, our notice. I don't. Hey, with Jill Butler? I don't see her here today. Okay. Uh, well, I'll ask her to send you, uh, I'm sure somebody in your group has, gets a notice. I'm sure someone does, yeah. I yeah. just, I have not been part of that, that process. Okay, because yeah, I remember when the uh, conservation ranch development happened and they were building vineyards and selling parcels in a small area there, maybe it was, couple hundred acres but yeah I think there's um I think there's one vineyard there now and I think when we purchased the property and had ag and open space put the easement on it that's when it was kind of consolidated and put into place okay and that yeah. whole model of uh, vineyards and um McMansions was uh scrapped when uh we stepped in for the conservation easement so um I think we're we're very thankful that the conservation fund has taken over that land. It's fantastic. I agree. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, keep coming to our meetings. We need you. I and will. I, I want to um, remind people that we need to move on in our agenda, but I still have a few more people that, that we need to hear from. And one of them is Fred. Fred here. First off, shout outs to everybody for doing such an amazing job. Um, uh, you know, my list is, is uh, doesn't include all of you, but we're, I'm, what, Peter's doing a uh, thousand acres of mastication. Um, Ryan's doing 4,000 acres of burning. Um, uh, Care Leone's coordinating everything. Judy has got the, the uh, coast going. Um, I'm just so excited by the way things are going here. Um, also shout out to Ellie for doing the, uh, workshop on how to make biochar. Um, I've been doing nothing but making biochar ever since, uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to make diamonds too, but that hasn't happened quite yet. <laughs> uh, but, but to a, a plant. Biochar is a diamond. I am personally just um, working with PG&E um, per Gene Chin's comments, which uh, came in and said, we're taking these trees. And then another crew came in and took everything else. So we're now in the middle of clear cuts of old growth trees uh, that were not approved by the landowner or even PG&E that I know of. Um, I believe it was not to cast aspersions. It wasn't Asflund. I believe it was Family Tree Service. Uh, watch the pink numbers on the trees and the pg &E coordinator seems to have vanished mysteriously. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also, uh, so Kim Sohn from Cal Fire will be issuing pg &E a, a violation 
as she is helping me get through how do you do another emergency on top of your emergency, which is illegal according to the forest practice rules. I'm also dealing with a water board uh, who are issuing violations for me because uh, AT&T put in a cable way that blew out completely for thousands of feet on my land and contributed a bunch of um, sediment to um, Mill Creek. So I'm basically working one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on the ground and uh, very happy to be doing that and can tell you a little bit more about Sonoma Land Trust and their goals for doing VTP and, um, and working with open space, doing a lot of a uh, th thousand acres of, of control on the ground, fire control. But just wonderful to hear from all of you. And um, this is exactly what this meeting is for. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Fred. Um, I'm gonna take a little um, drive out on Mill Creek Road and see what, see what changes have happened because of PG&E. Is it something that, that uh, I should talk to you about? Before no, I... public road. Yeah. I also wanted to point out that I saw an air, uh, something in the paper that Soper of Soper Wheeler will be uh, getting rid of their Sonoma lands. Um, does anybody know about that? Does open space know about that? Do we have any uh, conservation fund know about that? Uh, if somebody has money, this is a great time to give the soapers a call. Um, so be aware of that. There's, there's even a lake in there. <laughs> All I know is that, what, 2019, right before COVID, they were discussing that prior, but I have not heard of any revisit of that conversation. Yeah, so it was in the Press Democrat. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> My secret search for all. Yeah, not very secret. <laughs> well, well, Ryan, Ryan, it sounds like you should pass you should pass it along to somebody on your team um, that information. Uh, Jason Mills. Let me sp speak up just for a second. Um, Dee, I'd be happy to do that drive with you out west and maybe take some pictures. And Fred, maybe we can talk offline about uh, what's happened with PG&E in your area. I'll be online with you offline. <laughs> okay, All great. right. Thank you, Gene. Jason. All right. Well, brace yourselves for that Mill Valley trip. I, it's pretty uh, jarring when you get out there. Thanks, Fred, for helping to clean up that effort or try to recoup some of those damages and thanks to everybody for making sense of these really tricky situations and helping to streamline these funds to to make the best use of them i'm just looking forward to helping i'm out here in the sun enjoying the day we're planting plants it's uh, my favorite time for being in this industry and then we're shifting over to uh uh, fire recovery work pretty soon in January. So we're gonna be doing like the full suite of services and clearing out all the dead material, re-vegging, erosion control, invasive post-fire invasive plant containment. So all that good stuff. And uh, we just had a really good workshop with the Sonoma RCD for post-fire um, strategic response for land managers. And I just thought it was wonderful because we covered erosion control, veg management, uh, grazing and funding. So I'll throw that link up there. I was happy to cover the veg management part of this. And, and that's what I'm really hoping to help with all these efforts is now that we got them off the ground, making sure they're getting done right and making sure we're not causing more damage than good and just making sure these sites get maintained properly. So looks like we're, we're off and running here. So thanks okay. again, everybody. Thank you. And uh, I think we have two more people and I'll start with Adriana and then I will um, uh, let Robert speak and uh, we need to get on to his presentation. Okay, great. Sorry for the background noise. Um, Adriana Stegner with the Gold Ridge RCD. I don't really have any projects to report on right now. I've been busy with grad school and just trying to stay in touch with all the things that you guys are doing. Um, and I, I think that's it. I'll, I'll bring more information next time. All right. Um, did I miss anybody besides Robert 
uh, let me know and, and you can introduce yourselves. I think oh, Mary. Uh, yeah. Um, hey, sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, I'm just sort of a Kim accessory. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I think Kim really covered all the Ag and Open Space activities. It's super exciting. And um, I don't know if we'll cover it at this meeting, but I'm looking forward to hopefully hearing more about um, planned outreach to the agricultural community. I know there's talk of a, a workshop for that. So happy to be here. Okay, Robert. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, uh, Robert Aguero, uh, Senior Environmental Specialist and Forester with Permit Sonoma. Um, I think as far as updates from Permit Sonoma that Care Leon hasn't covered, um, our tree ordinance update went to the Planning Commission, I think at the beginning of November. Um, and so we got some feedback from them and myself and our plant, my planning partner on that are working on um, some more focused outreach. Um, like public outreach that um, all of y'all will be invited to um, in the new year. Um, so that's moving along. Um, been assisting Kim and Brooke and other county departments with forestry and CEQA stuff um, as that's kind of uh, filling my schedule a little bit more. Um, and then we are hiring um, two more environmental specialists. If you or anyone you know is interested, we're looking for um, a stormwater coordinator position um, and then also a general environmental review natural resources position. Um, so you can go to governmentjobs.com, uh, type in Sonoma County, and you'll find that uh, those postings if you or anyone you know is interested. So that's that's it for me. Um, yeah, I'm giving a little presentation on CEQA um, at some point today. Um, so. So let me know when you want me to do that. Okay, great. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so we, I think, uh, need to talk a little bit about funding opportunities. Um, and maybe, uh, Adriana, you can lead us through the other uh, couple of items that we have until we get to Robert. Sure. Yeah, let me just put our agenda up um, on the screen so everyone can see it. And, uh, the basic issue here is that we have um, a lovely uh, grant, uh, and I don't know if it's anonymous or not, but it's $5,000, and that's going to get uh, the Forest Working Group, uh, we're going to be able to maintain um, Adriana through April, but then we need to figure out where the rest of the funding is so that we can maintain her uh, and maybe even grow some. So that's what I wanna intro that we really need to uh, dig in and do our part for keeping this uh, group uh, running. And so Adriana, you want to take it from there? Sure, yeah. Um, so that's just part of the funding opportunities that I wanted to talk about. Um, so yeah, like Dee said, we're looking for continued funding for the Forest, Co Forest Working Group Coordinator, which is currently um, staffed by me. And um, yep, we have funding through April, thanks to a special donor. Um, but, you know, we're looking to continue that longer term, maybe over a year or two. And I think um, some of our good, some of our kind of hot leads on funding could be um, the CAL FIRE fire prevention grant um, program, which has just recently opened. I think apps are due in mid-February. And we're kind of talking about like, do we send in an individual um, proposal or do we um, see if there are any partners who would like to um, roll that ask into their proposal? So if someone already has education outreach um, type work going into a CAL FIRE proposal, maybe we can piggyback on that. Um, we're also going to just talk to our, you know, our Cal Fire reps, Tom Connect and others to see if this is a um, competitive um, project component um, or if they don't encourage us to apply. Um, I also got suggestions to look at other funding sources like the um, California Forest uh, Landowners Council and so the National Forest Landowners Councils to see if they have any kind of grant programs that could support this work. So we've been brainstorming um, in the steering committee. If you all have any ideas about funding sources that can be of help, please send them on to me. Um, sometimes there are things out there that you know you just don't know what you don't know. We're not 
might not have ever heard of some good fit brand out there. So let us know if you know one. Adriana, are we thinking about the PG&E uh, uh, grant opportunity? Is that a fit or not? I don't think so, because I think as Kim has said, it's really implementation focused, okay. um, whereas ours is really coordination. Okay, thank you. So. I think it's uh, valuable to go through the criteria and to see if there is a fit there. We do support some of the programs um, in the first round. Um, so um, we can revisit after the workshops and see if that's a good fit. Good. Right. Let's do that. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that would be that would be great if it could be locally funded. So there's that. And then I think the other part of the of this item is just touching base with all of you on funding opportunities that are applicable to you. I know we've talked um, in our updates about the Coastal Commission, um, fire prevention, um, you know, program that's out right now. And um, so if, if people wanted to touch on that a little bit more, if, if there's any like thoughts that weren't already mentioned in our, in our earlier session, please feel free. Um, yeah, does anyone have any other comments on that Coastal Commission one? You mean Coastal Conservancy? <clears throat> Coastal Conservancy, is that what you mean? Oh, sorry. <laughs> let's, let's touch on the uh, outreach activities update. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that are in, engaged with this, with this um, subject. Okay, great. Yeah, I think um, it's good if everyone's already in touch about other grants that they want to partner on. And and please, you know, that door is always open and everyone are in monthly meetings to talk about, you know, proposal collaboration. Um, but moving on in the agenda, our steering committee report, I think, you know, we basically just talked about funding in this last month. And we also talked about our outreach activities. Um, so we'll elaborate on that in a minute. Um, thank you, Carolyn, for giving us the CWPP update. That was great. And yeah, so for our work plan, how we're achieving our work plan, um, we're pretty focused on this ag mixer. And so thank you, Mary and, and others for being here, um, kind of thinking about the best way to engage our ag community. Um, I, if the steering committee um, discussed having just one-on-one -on -one kind of interviews with a few ag leaders to get their best thoughts on how to structure this event. Um, what would be a good use of at the ag community's time? What kind of um, topics would they wanna talk about? Uh, how, how can we really leverage each other? And so, let me grab my list. I think that um, some of the ag leaders that we were planning on reaching out to were, um, well, I think we were gonna um, check in with Mary about some um, of the easement holders with Ag and Open Space, um, some of the ag operators who have conservation easements on their property who could help guide us. Um, it would be good to get a small handful of, of those folks to talk with. We also talked about um, interviewing Tony Tosconi from the Farm Bureau, um, the Ag Commissioner for the county as well. And um, we really wanted to get, um, if we didn't feel like it was already covered, getting someone from the Vineyard community, um, or some of the Dutton's potentially, um, or Jackson. Um, we also have, uh, I know Judy's been talking about some uh, Vineyard um, owners operators in the Coast Ridge area. I think it was Wild Hog, um, who would be, you know, they've already, they are already practiced in this kind of like collaborative forest land management, um, planning work. So it'd be great to hear from them. Um, and lastly on the list was um, just the RCD. Uh, Joe Posey is, has, is a longtime um, RCD manager member, and I'm just getting some thoughts on him um, or from him. So hey, Diana, who is doing these interviews? Do you need help? Yeah, I think we would like to put have kind of like a small panel. And um, I was thinking that um, it, well, we talked in the steering committee about having um, Shone Farm Brianna Boas there, cause she's, you know, really working at the nexus of um, ag and forest management. So we'd love to have her on it. Mary, you'd be a great addition from Ag and Open Space. Um, 
Ellie, we, I was thinking you would be a good member on this panel too, just because you've been working so much with um, the ecological best management practices, which I think is a really relevant topic for um, the, our ag community. And, um, and then, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm open to anyone who would like to volunteer their time on this panel. It's not too many, I don't think it's too many interviews and it wouldn't take too much time. I have and, and you're gonna be uh, overseeing this and uh, is that correct? I'm happy to help organize the, just like schedule of interviews and come up with interview questions with the panel um, so that we are making good use of interview time. Okay, good, thank you. Um, when you're talking about easement landholders, um, are you looking for particular characteristics of the easement landholders? Um, I, I'm thinking, you know, easement landholders who have both ag and forestry use on their lands. Are there any other characteristics you'd be looking for? Um, I think Kim has an idea. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're exactly right, Mary. Uh, and this is kind of the, what started this discussion about ag users. Uh, Fred has been drilling into our heads the idea that behind every vineyard is a, a very unmanaged forest. So um, I think uh, we really want to see that nexus between uh, any kind of agricultural production uh, and those resources that are part of a watershed. Um, and so this is not putting anybody under the, um, the critical eye of why aren't you managing your forest? And maybe they are just um, sometimes the expertise to do agricultural production doesn't necessarily mesh well with the expertise to manage a, fire, a forested landscape. So we wanted to kind of open up the dialogue to start having that conversation of how do we um, uh, provide any kind of assistance or uh, technical support or just begin the dialogue of uh, you know, where those resources are being, how those resources are being managed. And then the, the workshop, if I could just ask another really quick question, the workshop or is separate from these interviews, right? The interviews would take place before the workshop or would the interviews be like the event at the workshop? No, they'd be in, in advance. So the interviews are, are to help us design the workshop or the, the event, whatever it may be. We, you know, we've been thinking and kind of visioning what this um, event might look like and realizing we really need input from the ad community to make it great. So we want, we thought we'd do um, a little bit of inter interviewing ahead of time. Judy, did you have something to ask or say? <clears throat> we have a board meeting tomorrow night and I will talk to Daniel Schoenfeld about Wild Hog Vineyard. <clears throat> He's had, um, we've been up there with Stephanie Larson looking at grazing. Fred's been up there looking at uh, managing his oak woodlands and his grasslands. And he has just a mess in that while in his canyon of uh, fire. And he's now working with uh, Matt Green to get a forest management plan to do the, um, uh, what is it? The other CFIP that uh, Jason was doing. And he might be willing to talk um, because he, uh, he needs a lot of work done to manage his forest and uh, is, reaching out and has reached out for assistance from everywhere and anywhere he could find it. So we've had NRCS up there as well. Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, as a small vineyard owner, um, he, he brings a lot to this discussion about, you know, how hard it is to manage his vineyard and also manage his forest and where does that money come from? And, mm -hmm. uh, but he's trying to do the right thing. And mm -hmm. so um, I will talk to him tomorrow night and Great. see if he would be willing to have a conversation and be part of this interview. Great. Awesome. Great. Okay, yeah. on to activities. Um, you want to cover this too, Adrian, if you would? Sure. Yeah. And just to wrap up that last item, um, if anyone else wants to be a part of the, the panel, just let me know. I think, you know, obviously everyone on the steering committee is included. I didn't really say that um, before, but, um, but yeah, so we'll just, next steps, we'll just be reaching out to a few people and scheduling times, and then the panel can come up with some questions and that'll be it. And I think the, the target date for this event would be April, May, like, later in 2022. Um, so we have some time to, to do a good job planning. 
Um, so let me reshare the agenda we were just looking at. Um, let's see. Okay, so great. On to outreach activities and updates. Um, the future brown bag presentations. Um, we have kind of um, tabled these for now since we're working on more field trip related outreach, but I just wanted to keep them on our minds. So two um, topics that got some um, high votes last time we, we voted on topics was um, how to implement large scale forest management in Sonoma County. And by large scale, I think we really mean kind of like the Coast Ridge model, like how are we getting multiple property owners, not just Coast Ridge, there are others too, but um, how are we really working like at scale and how can we do more of that? I think that's something we're always talking about in our meetings, but it'd be nice to like put some focus on that at some point. And then another one is um, prescribed burn associations and prescribed burns. How do they work? What's the timing? Who does them? There's also, of course, like um, uh, liability and um, permitting issues around those activities. So that complicates things. It'd be good to talk about that sometime. Um, I wanted to get an update from anyone who can about the JC's um, Land Under Boot Camp. Fred, I think last time we heard about it, it was having, it, it's a spring launch for that, that program. I think it's going to be in the spring. Um, I, I just want to mention, I don't know if you're there, Fred, but um, we're going to be meeting with Brianna and, and your, your name has been in the mix too, but we're meeting her with, with her on Friday. We had to, but to, because the funding from Fire Safe Sonoma was going to, um, close out at the end of this year. Um, and we found out about it just a few weeks ago, we were working quickly. So um, we're talking with Brianna about doing some landowner, homeowner workshops to kind of jumpstart the forest landowner boot camp. Um, but that's still like very, very early in conversation. And um, that's it. Nice. I think that's a, that's a really good fit though. That's great. Um, okay. Well, so then moving on to our tours, um, we've got three of them lined up in January. We'll be doing the riparian forest management um, demystification workshop, which is all about just talking about some of these thorny issues with, with streams and how do we manage the vegetation around them. And I'm really happy to share that we have um, confirmed hosts from Sonoma Land Trust, Ag and Open Space, um, the Ecology Center, and um, we're going to reach out to ACR too. And that will be to take us to the Calabasas Creek Preserve, um, which has been managed for a long time by Agnope Space, but will be, um, or has recently been transferred to regional parks. Um, the Bouverie Preserve and um, Glen Oaks Ranch. Um, and those are all in the Glen Ellen area. Uh, so it'll be, oh, as well as a couple of private properties, uh, that have had work from Sonoma Ecology Center done on them. So we'll be kind of hopping around between a few different places, looking at creeks in each one, talking about different um, management objectives and how people uh, achieve um, that work. And um, I have confirmed speakers from um, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Robin Swan, um, as well as we're, we're reaching out to a few others. I know we'll have a few foresters there, including Fred. Um, it would be really good to have Cal Fire there and um, Robert or anyone from Permit Sonoma who can make it, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, I'll be kind of uh, surveying everyone for their best dates in January. We wanna do a weekday since so many of the people who are a part of this are employees of, you know, they're, they're employees. So we want them to be working during the work week and not having to take their weekends for this. Um, so any words on that before I move on? I think most of that coordination is gonna happen over email, but we can take a minute here in the meeting to talk about it if you want. No, all right. Um, uh, we should really try to nail the date down pretty quick because a lot's going on in January. Um, and not to, uh, to push the issue for my uh, public employee brethren, but um, Saturdays do work. Uh, it's really, our, I think our, our, our our draw is to make sure that we get as many interested landowners, anybody managing resources to the table. Yep, so true. we should just uh, make sure that all options are out there. We just want to make sure if we're going to put all the effort into getting people into the field, that we make it worthwhile. 
but I, I thank you for making the comment about public employment. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, if it's easiest for, because this is really an event for the working group members. So if it's easier for all the members to attend on a weekend, then maybe that's what we should be doing. Um, this is Fred. Uh, if it is uh, a weekend and we have a little bit of extra time, I'd like to get people down to the White Oak Ranch uh, uh, and look at thinning that happened 20 years ago that they are redoing right now. And oh, wow. uh, they also have fabulous flowers and food. And we can probably um, <clears throat> enjoy our day off there. Uh, mm -hmm. So that could be a nice add on. Okay. Yeah, this event's already going to be at least four hours long. So we'll see if people are out for a whole day excursion. Well, that's why um, I figured they need refreshments at the end. I was going to say, I think you can entice them. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Great, great, cool. Okay, so then in February, we'll be, um, I've been working with Fred and um, Brandon O'Neill from State Parks to take us out to the coast, um, Salt Point area to look at the forest health issues out there. I think that's a really really good site to look at and we can talk about kind of like analogies for other other forest landscapes in the county um, that aren't maybe dealing with the same pests but um just what do you do when you have that kind of situation so that's the new schedule for february and then in march we'll be with peter out in england looking at his projects on the uh, pacific union college's land it's gonna be a great um, tour you don't want to miss it yeah don't <laughs> miss that it's been a long time coming. <laughs> I can't remember. Did you do something last year too? Or did we just do a... No, a we planned something and it fell through for a number of reasons. So this is going to be an exciting time because I've got a lot of projects rolling. Some will be in the works at that time. So it's a great time for a tour out here. Oh, awesome. Okay. All right. And then in April, I think um, we have kind of an open invitation from... Devin and Michael to come out and see some of the things that we looked at a few last month or the month before. No, I think it was last month. Devin gave his presentation about everything they're doing up there at Pepperwood. So we want to make our way out to Pepperwood and see some of that firsthand. Um, and then someday we'll be hopefully um, looking at tribal land with the Kashaya on the coast. And then um, and then Ellie, I just have this kind of standing um, topic here about ecological fuels management. And I don't know if that's going to be kind of an, a, a one-time presentation or, or something that we just address. It's, kind of, it's kind of happening in multiple ways, but it's kind of it's kind of um, growing and evolving, and um, and it's really a partnership. So it's it's <laughs> yeah, more to more to come for sure. Thanks. Okay, and then also as Robert mentioned earlier, um, I think in the new year he will. Um, engage us with the Sonoma County Tree Ordinance updates. Um, I don't know if that'll come in the form of just like a short presentation at one of our meetings, or maybe we'll have a standalone um, um, workshop to, to do Q and A, gather input, but you'll let us know on time's right. Cool. All right. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much, Adriana. That's terrific. So much going on and all good. Uh, yeah. I would now like to, uh, have Robert come um, before us and uh, make some comments and introduce uh, CEQA from the county perspective. And I'm sure we'll have time for some questions and answers. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is a good presentation. I know, you know, not everyone gets as excited about um, environmental compliance, maybe like I do. <laughs> um, but they I think get anxious, <laughs> I don't know about excited. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think with the opening of the veg management grant from Ag and Open Space, um, it's an important presentation, and I appreciate the, the chance to do it now um, with this group in a safe space, um, because you will probably see a, another draft of this presentation in January at the workshops for the grant. Um, but you know, I so I was on the selection committee for the grant last year, and one of the problems that we saw, or that I saw because it was my job to find these problems, um, was um, confusion about CEQA compliance and what that actually looks like um, for vegetation management projects and how to, how to do that um, as a private applicant applying for public funds. Um, so with that, I can dive into the presentation. Let me see if I could share my screen. Yes, I can. So let's see. Okay. So does everyone see the presentation? Yep. Okay, great. Um, 
All right, so we'll just get into it. Uh, so yeah, so intro to CEQA for vegetation management. Um, yes, uh, if you join late, my name is Robert Aguero. Uh, I'm an RPF and I work with uh, Permit Sonoma in the planning department. Um, so let's see, all right. So just a few disclaimers up front. I am not a lawyer. Um, this is not legal advice. Um, for the sake of this presentation, I am not representing the county's opinions or views. Um, I'm a practitioner and just offering my um, professional judgment and guidance on how to do CEQA. Um, and then also, this is just a brief overview um, focused for fuels reduction, veg management type projects. Um, there are a ton of in-depth trainings and presentations on CEQA online. Um, if you do find this type of stuff interesting, and if you do want to dig into the weeds on this, um, there's a lot more out there. CAL FIRE has a really good presentation. Uh, if you just type in CEQA fuels reduction presentation, I think it's like the second or third thing that pops up um, for a presentation that they did, I think, at the CLFA workshop a couple years ago um, that I, I took a lot from, um, but that's more focused for CAL FIRE projects. Um, so just if you're interested in their process, that's a good resource. Um, so a brief outline, we're going to go over what is CEQA, um, when and to who does CEQA apply, um, the types of CEQA documents um, that you may run into when you are um, preparing projects, and then just some best practices. Um, and then also, yeah, like Dee said, hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A. So first, what is CEQA? Um, if you didn't know, it is the California Environmental Quality Act. It was enacted in 1970. It's modeled after the uh, after NEPA, which is the National, National Environmental Policy Act. It's not Protection Act, it is policy, because that's what NEPA is, it's policy. Um, in state legislature um, or state law, CEQA is found in two spots, in the Public Resources Code and then in the California Code of Regulations. Um, and then also, I included this link, if you just type in CEQA Handbook 2021, in Google, um, you can find all of CEQA in a lovely PDF prepared by uh, the Association of Environmental Planners. So that's a really good resource, especially if you need to refer to categorical exemptions, CEQA language, all that kind of stuff, which I will go over in this presentation. Um, so really, you know, I think one thing that gets confused is what is CEQA? Um, CEQA requires government agencies in the state of California to inform the, their decision makers. So for us at the county, that's often the Board of Supervisors, Planning Commission, EZA. Um, at the state level, it's normally like the heads of their various state agencies um, about project impacts and then how to reduce those impacts to the maximum extent feasible. Um, CEQA allows for public input into the decision-making process. Um, and then finally, uh, CEQA is a process. It is not a permit. You don't get a CEQA permit. Um, you often, what is prepared is a CEQA document that analyzes the project impacts. Um, but really what CEQA is, it's a process that governments go through for transparency about uh, impacts to projects. Um, and then just one more thing, for those who work in the federal funding world um, and have to deal with NEPA, the biggest difference between CEQA and NEPA is that NEPA doesn't actually require you to mitigate or reduce impacts. It just requires you to disclose them. While in CEQA, you actually are required to reduce impacts um, if there are impacts. So like I said, who does CEQA apply to? It applies to public agencies. Um, so here's just a list of public agencies that CEQA may apply to, state agencies, county cities, universities, special districts like the RCD, LAFCO, fire districts, um, and then a list of who CEQA does not apply to, you know, the feds, other states, um, and then of course, private groups. Um, of note, CEQA doesn't apply to fire safe councils, but fire safe council projects that have state or local money CEQA applies to those projects. So I know it's kind of confusing, but um, if someone is saying, you know, like I have to do CEQA for a project, it's likely that their project has some sort of uh, state or local government nexus that the project requires CEQA, but you do not have to do CEQA. The government has to do CEQA. Um, so yes, CEQA classifies government agencies into lead agencies and responsible agencies. And so 
The lead agency is the agency that has um, the primary responsibility for carrying out or approving a project. Um, and then underlined here, the lead agency will ultimately determine what level of SQL analysis is ultimately required. Um, so for example, say there's some type of county funded vegetation management grant project um, and no other agency takes a lead agency role, um, then the county would take on the lead agency role in that case. Um, and then responsible agencies are agencies other than the lead agency, which have a responsibility for carrying out or approving a project. Um, a common example of this is a CDFW uh, lake and stream bed alteration permit that's required for a timber harvest plan where CAL FIRE is the lead agency ultimately for approving the timber harvest plan. Um, so one of the things that happens in CEQA is we will, like at the county, we'll refer out our projects or the projects that we get to other government agencies to get their input, figure out what they need um, for their approvals to make sure they're complying with other state and environmental laws. Um, so then when does CEQA apply? CEQA applies to projects um, and then CEQA guidelines Section 15378 defines what projects are. And so then I put that up here. It's um, the whole of an action, which has the potential for resulting in either a direct physical change in the environment or a reasonably foreseeable indirect physical change in the environment. And that is any of the following. So an activity directly undertaken by a public agency, um, an activity undertaken by someone that's getting uh, government support through contracts, grants, subsidies, loans, or other forms of assistance. And then also um, any activity that involves the issuance of a permit um, or lease or other type of government approval or entitlement to a project. Um, so that would be, you know, if you have to get a use permit from the county, that use permit has to go through CEQA. So that normally goes to like the BZA or the planning commission um, or ultimately the board of supervisors sometimes. Um, but of note, like, you know, sometimes, um, people will apply for government funding for like an educational program. I think like, like I think SEC uh, got some money last year or Fire Safe Sonoma got some money last year from the veg management program. That is not considered a project under CEQA because it is not an activity that has the potential for a um, environmental impact because it's just an educational program, it's an outreach program. Um, so then types of CEQA documents. Um, we have notices of exemptions, we have negative declarations and mitigated negative declarations, and then we have environmental impact reports or EIRs. Um, I think the ones that are most applicable to fuel reduction vegetation management projects are notice of exemptions, such as categorical exemptions or statutory exemptions, and then um, probably the mitigated negative declaration. Um, and so we're going to go over all three of these types um, in a little bit more detail, um, but just wanted to give a brief overview of these. So a categorical exemption, and these are categories of types of projects that may be exempt under CEQA. And there is, I know this, there's a lot of like weird legal language in here because there's not a project under CEQA and then there's exempt under CEQA. Um, and so if something is exempt under CEQA, that means it's exempt from going through the uh, review process required for a negative declaration or an EIR, but it still has to be analyzed under CEQA. Um, and then if something is not a project under CEQA, it just doesn't apply at all. So I know it's confusing. I hope I can clarify more if you have questions during a Q&A. Um, and then a statutory exemption are, those are types of projects that have been specifically exempted from CEQA by state legislature. So the most common one that we deal with at the county is, um, or at least in my world, are emergency projects. So like if something like the, during these atmospheric rivers and we have to repair a road or repair a culvert, we'll uh, normally what we would do CEQA for, we just have um, an emergency exemption um, to just repair it like immediately right away without going through the regular process. So categorical exemptions, um, these are types of projects that have been um, put into classes really that are determined to not have significant impacts on the environment. And these projects are typically considered exempt based on their um, geographic location and then scope and size. And so then a really common one is the minor alterations to land defensible space exemption, um, like this graphic that we've all seen here, fuel reduction up to hundred feet from a structure is generally considered exempt from CEQA in most circumstances. 
Um, some, exa some other examples that may apply to vegetation management projects, um, there is the um, existing facilities exemption. Um, so the num so sorry, I'll take a step back. The numbers that are here, um, the numbers in parentheses refers to the CEQA guidelines section. So uh, existing facilities can be found in CEQA guidelines section 15301. And then the underlying number is the class. So often we'll refer to these as a class one, a class four, a class 33 exemption, um, just when we're talking about projects. So an existing facilities exemption, um, we use those, I've used those for um, public works maintaining vegetation in the public road right of way. Like if they're like just pulling out like a bunch of like broom or something, um, that would be considered an existing facilities because we are maintaining that facility. Um, like I said earlier, the minor alterations to land, the class four exemption, um, defensible space exemption, the class seven and class eight exemptions. Um, these are actions by regulatory agencies for natural resources protection um, or protection of the environment. And then small habitat restoration projects or class 33 exemptions. Those are, um, we use those a lot for like bank restoration type projects um, because there's some size limitations, I think. I think it has to be less than five acres. No mechanized equipment can be used. Um, so projects like that, like replanting projects. Um, so then, yeah, the one most common one for vegetation management that I see is the class four exemption. So it's minor alterations to land. Um, and so these exemptions, um, these projects consist of Minor alterations, which CEQA unfortunately does not give a definition of minor, um, which do not involve the removal of healthy, mature, or, or sorry, healthy, mature, scenic trees, um, except for forestry or ag purposes. Um, and then an example is the within 30 feet of structures to reduce the volume of flammable vegetation. And then that can be expanded up to 100 feet from a structure if the public agency having fire protection responsibility makes the determination that 100 feet is required um, due to extra hazardous fire conditions. Um, you know, one sometimes we see projects um, that try, or people that try to propose these types of exemptions for projects that don't fit under the scope of this exemption. So like it may be up to 200 feet from the road or they'll try to just say, um, working in the water, they'll, they'll, I've seen projects where they just want to do fuel reduction using this exemption, but there's no structure tied to the fuel reduction. And so then we can't approve it under this type of exemption. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a lot of text, but I tried to emphasize the important points of this slide. So within these exemptions, there are exceptions that would kick it out of an exemption and into a higher level secret review. Um, and so the first one uh, refers to location. So if, for example, um, a defensible space project was located in a spot where there's like a ton of sensitive habitat or it's in a creek or somewhere um, that CEQA defines as an environmental resource of critical concern that is mapped um, and officially adopted pursuant to law, for example, like the, the county's riparian corridors, it may, kick it out of that um, CEQA exemption into a higher level CEQA review. Um, another exception is cumulative impact. So if it's a project that's just occurring year in and year out, and um, there's no consideration of cumulative impact, then that could kick it out of an exemption. Um, another one is scenic highways. Um, so projects that take place in um, state listed scenic highways may not qualify for an exemption, and then historical resources. I think this one's really important um, because what we may consider historical resources that the county could include um, archeological resources. And um, in the next slide, I will talk about how, you know, with these exemptions, you can't mitigate impacts. You have to totally avoid impacts. Um, so I'll just go to the next slide to talk about that. Um, so yeah, so, if you are proposing a project under an exemption, it has to avoid impacts. You can't mitigate impacts. Um, and what I mean by that, um, what I like on this slide, this is just a CNDDB map of Mount Diablo. Um, and if someone was to propose a CEQA project or sorry, like a, a defensible space project through here, I would, I would say absolutely not 
because there's all these listed mapped resources. Um, so I would need to see how they're demonstrating that they are not going to impact listed plants. Or if someone is proposing some type of ground disturbing work using a CEQA exemption, I would want to know that they've done an archaeological survey to make sure that there's no impact to um, potential cultural resources. Um, so that way we know that they're avoiding it. Um, with higher level CEQA documents, like a, a mitigated negative declaration or an EIR, um, you can mitigate those, um, but that also requires more time in preparing the document. Um, let's see, negative declaration. I think I'm, I'm gonna actually skip this section because I've kind of talked a little bit about it. Um, but really these apply to larger fuel reduction projects um, where that they don't fit into the nice neat box of categorical exemption. Um, and usually they require a higher level review, a lot more studies would go into them. Um, so I'm gonna skip through these just for timing's sake. Um, mitigation, EIRs. Um, I hope none <laughs> of you ever have to prepare an EIR um, for a fuel reduction project. That would be absurd um, and not something I would ever wish upon any of you. Um, program EIRs. Um, that, this is what the Cal VTP is. Um, the Vegetation Treatment Program EIR um, has done environmental analysis already, and it's done a lot of the public review and public commenting period that is required for a regular EIR. Um, and so what these program EIRs do is they, they do the analysis over a broad geographical area, and then projects can make findings that they fit under the scope of an EIR. Um, so the Cal VTP, the lead agency for this is the Board of Forestry, um, and they allow project proponents to comply with CEQA for vegetation treatments consistent with the analysis done under their program EIR. So for example, like um, some of the work that Ag and Open Space is funding through last year's grants um, is going to be funded or is going to go through the Cal VTP process. Um, and we're going to use their environmental analysis and make our findings as the county that these, these projects fit under the scope of the work that was analyzed under the program EIR. Um, we still have to do botanical surveys, we still have to do bio surveys, cultural surveys. So it doesn't remove that much of the actual like field work components, but it does remove a lot of the public noticing and public commenting requirements. Um, so these treatments under the Cal VTP have to occur in the treatable landscape, which is just the SRA. That's what, that's what they analyzed. Um, and then veg vegetation treatments covered in the VTP include prescribed burning, mechanical treatments, manual treatments um, like hand crews, uh, prescribed herbivory like grazing, and then herbicide application. Um, and then the Cal VTP defines project proponents, so people who can use the Cal VTP for their projects, um, as uh, basically the same as CEQA. So any local or state agency that's providing funding or with land ownership or land management responsibilities, it's like Cal Fire, counties, cities, water agencies, special districts, open space districts, et cetera. Um, and then private landowners can't use the VTP for CEQA compliance without the involvement of an agency willing to take it on as a project proponent. So um, like Ryan earlier was saying about the conservation funds property, Cal Fire is gonna be taking on the, the project proponent role. Um, so there needs to be some sort of government nexus. So if I owned like 400 acres of forest, and I wanted um, to use the VTP without a government agency, I couldn't do it. Um, I also wouldn't need to do CEQA in that case to begin with, but if I wanted to get coverage for like burn boss liability, um, I would need some form of government involvement. Um, and so then the Cal VTP requires development of a project specific analysis, um, which is um, really like the CEQA checklist um, where you are just making uh, findings that you're not impacting certain environmental factors. Um, adherence to standard project requirements. So these are really high prescriptive standards, like thou shall not do work in the stream channel, thou shall not um, impact these species. Um, you need to do bird surveys if you're gonna be impacting, um, or if you're gonna be cutting down trees during nesting bird season, things like that. Um, and then uh, prescriptive mitigation measures that are outlined in the program EIR. 
Um, and then Kim asked me to do a note on the forest practice rules um, because we got questions about this last year during the grant program. Um, so the forest practice rules or the, yeah, the forest practice rules, they're considered um, what's called a certified regulatory program under CEQA, which means they're exempt from preparing um, an initial study, a negative declaration or an EIR. Um, but they only apply when timber operations on timber land occurs. Um, and those definitions are outlined in public resource code. Um, they also state that a timber harvest plan is considered the functional equivalent of an EIR, which is what allows them to be considered a certified regulatory program. Um, and then CAL FIRE is the lead agency for all forest practical projects. So we at the county cannot act as lead agency on a project proposing to use the forest practice rule. So if someone wanted to get county grant funding to do a timber harvest, we what the decision we made last year was we are not going to fund those types of projects because we cannot be the lead agency. We, do, we can't exert control um, in terms of like environmental impact uh, mitigation um, because CAL FIRE has to be the lead agency for those types of projects. And then we also found um, the county did not want to um, fund timber harvesting type projects through the vegetation management grant program last year as well. Um, and then finally, just some best practices. I know I just covered a lot of information that um, is probably a lot of, it's confusing to me still, even as a practitioner, to be frank. Um, but really best practices, um, I would recommend having a PDF copy of the CEQA guidelines when you are preparing any project that has to comply with CEQA um, in order to understand the applicability and limitations, um, particularly the categorical exemption section. Um, if you are trying to get a project to fit under a categorical exemption. Um, when you're applying for uh, grant funding, um, describe your project in a like strong, descriptive, detailed narrative. Um, it helps us figure out um, when we're reviewing projects, like what's happening where, and that's really what we want to know. Um, we love to see maps, um, look, you know it, so knowing where the project's going to occur, including a fo project footprint. You know, if you say you're going to do defensible space around 50 homes, I would like to see where are those 50 homes and where is that defense space occurring? Because what I'm going to do if I'm reviewing a project is I'm just going to open up um, CNDDB and see where listed species are or a documented occurrences of listed species are. And if the project is in that area, um, I'm going to make a note of that and see if we need to flesh out the project a little more. Or if I don't know where the project is, then a project that's similar will, um, but has more detail, will probably go higher up on my, on my ranking. Um, consider seasonal issues that could impact project timing, um, like bird nesting, wet weather, burn season. Um, I think that's just good practice for any type of projects, even outside of CEQA compliance. Um, and then if you need other permits, like fish and wildlife permits, encroachment permits from the county, things like that, Get those first or start the process um, in communicating with the agencies first. So that way um, we know that you've done your due diligence in talking to all the necessary government agencies that could be involved in the process. So that way we have um, a better footing from a CEQA perspective um, if we need to reach out to them. So that's, that's my presentation. I'm sorry, it was um, a little rushed. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions now if I have not put you all to sleep. Uh, hi, um, Robert, this is Jean Chin. That was really a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, very clear, direct, succinct. Are you with the Department of Fish and Wildlife? No, I am with um, the planning department at Sonoma County. Ah, okay. Yeah, I thought that was great too. Thanks, Robert, so much for that kind of digestible overview of what CEQA is and when we might use it. I think, I feel like everyone has kind of brushed up with CEQA, CEQA at some point um, or come into contact with it. But um, if anyone has any questions about like situational situations where you might need to use it, probably Robert can help you um, figure that out. Yeah, I would like to just, Robert, obviously I have uh, questions for you regarding our project and uh, I'll just uh, 
email you and work with you online uh, through email because you brought up a number of things that uh, brought up some questions for what we're doing on Fort Ross Road. And so I'll be in touch later, but thank you. That was a great presentation. Yeah, thanks. I've got, I've got one question. Uh, uh, what I, I used to be a contractor and I would take over landscapes that had been abused. And uh, do you get very many people who just start projects and uh, they didn't do any of the work ahead of time and you have to do remedial and the responsibility might be on the new owner or something like that. Does that happen very often? You know, yeah, we, we run into that. Um, I think from a sequel perspective, I think it would just kind of depend on what the, the nexus is for the, the government's involvement. You know, um, I, I work with our code enforcement department quite a bit um, when there's violations that may have happened. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I didn't cover, um, but that's important, CEQA, from a CEQA perspective, I can only analyze a project as it comes to the county or as it comes to me as the government agency. And so that's what's considered CEQA baseline. Um, so if someone wanted to do a project, I'll give you an example. Um, we deal with minor timberland conversions a lot. So like less than three acre timberland conversions. Um, those are um, a zoning permit under the county's guidelines and then they're um, an exemption under the forest practice rules. Um, so what we've seen happen is people who have lost forest land in fires and then they salvage log it um, and then they wanna put in like a house or something in that area or a vineyard or something. Um, and so then I can only analyze the project as it comes into me. And what often happens is it's a cleared piece of land that was burned in the fires. And so then it's like, well, I have nothing to analyze here because it's, it's nothing. But because it's considered timberland, it still needs to get a timberland conversion permit, um, as opposed to someone like on the coast where they haven't lost any forest and they want to convert some of the land to a house or something like that. Then we have to do a more high level analysis because there's actual trees that are coming out. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. That's kind of where I took it. Um, but is that helpful, I guess, Ron? Yeah, I was just wondering, because, you know, we the RCDs provide a service to mm -hmm. do all the paperwork, and uh, we haven't had any problems. But uh, I see people doing projects, you know, in their backyards. That, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. uh, it's uh, there's no bounty on that. <laughs> I don't want to make someone no. get mad at me. <laughs> Uh, um, Robert, there's been um, some landowners that have had their forest burned and their house burned, and then when they want to rebuild their house, they decide they really like uh, uh, to have more views, mm -hmm. and so they cut trees um, without anybody knowing they are, or they find out, is there any recourse? Um. Yeah, there is. Uh, I would. This is not really a sequel question. This is more of a um, law question. I think there is. Um, you can always file a complaint with our code enforcement department. Um, I think we have certain rules requiring um, permits for cutting down trees in circumstances. Um, there is a chance with you know. So just again, not legal advice, just general right, right. Uh, interpretation of code. Um, if someone is rebuilding a house in an area that, um, was forested and then they want to increase their view shed, um, I would gen generally include that tree removal in like the conversion area, um, because it's for a purpose, um, now that some people may think that's government overreach and that's fine to have that opinion as well. Um, so that's, I think that's just, uh, my perspective, you can always file a complaint with CAL FIRE and our code enforcement department if you see trees being removed that you think shouldn't be removed, and then we'll normally investigate in some circumstances. So yeah, there is there is recourse available. And do you happen to know if that is a frequent uh, situation with uh, be people being uh, reported uh, to code enforcement? Um, I don't know. I think, I mean, we, our code enforcement 
department is busy. So I think people, they definitely go out and check things, um, but I don't have the numbers mm -hmm. in front of me to know how often code enforcement goes out to check tree related issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just come up in conversations a number of times, but I don't really have any facts. Mm -hmm. So I, I was just, uh, so I could, when they're not busy, code enforcement would call me back, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I do have one question for you, Robert. Um, there are three subdivided ranches along Fort Ross Road, as I'm sure you know. Um, two of them had EIRs done in the 70s, the Navarro Ranch and the Lawala Ranch. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have, you know, the studies, the surveys, the ARC review. And in fact, I was just, just read through one of them um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now, would that um, still be out applicable to what we're doing now um there has not been that much um development Jerry Garvey, this is gene wetzel chin uh -huh. and it was such a pleasure to hear from you looks like uh so i'm just wondering are they still uh can we still use uh those eirs for us and related yeah um i would say anything that old would generally be no, unfortunately, um, because for a couple of reasons. One, I, I guess it depends on what the EIR was done for, um, but then also, um, you know, with like biological and botanical review, often what happens is more species have been added to the lists um, mm -hmm. of what needs to be covered. The conditions have probably changed a little bit to warrant um, new reviews. And then best practice, I would say for ARC reports is generally five years. Um, that's just kind of like the rule of thumb. There's no like official guidance on that, I think. Um, but that's just generally what most governments require. Um, if your ARC report's more than five years old, you probably need a new one. Um, okay. Because this, I think the reason for that is like the status for what's considered um, historical is, I think it's 50 years and maybe 45. Um, so something that 45 or, you know, 40 years ago wasn't considered historical, five years later may be considered historical by the letter of the law. Um, so mm -hmm. there is some um, need to kind of like incorporate that into an analysis, unfortunately. Right. And these reviews were done uh, to subdivide the ranches. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Um, this is Lynn Garrick, and I, I have a question. I for our Fire Safe Council, when we're trying to look at projects we would like to propose to different funding sources, it I think our, our confusion comes around the definition or lack of definition of minor in minor alterations. Um, so some and, and specifically, we would, you know, one idea is that we would like to see some additional fire breaks, and we're looking at fire breaks that used to exist in the past. So it, can you help me on the on the continuum of minor work to major work? If we're looking at just using hand tools and you doing brush removal on up to removal of dead trees that would require chainsaws on up to bulldozers, mm -hmm. where does minor stop and major begin? Yeah. Um... I wish I had a good answer for you, Lynn. Um, I think, so the minor alterations to land exemption, it, I would say it has to be tied to a structure. Um, oftentimes roads are interpreted as structures or trails in parks case. Um, and so you could go up to a hundred feet um, with, uh, you know, like Cal Fire's uh, written documentation that up to a hundred feet is needed. Um, so that's one method. So, um, you know, if there was like a road out there that you wanted to extend a fuel break along up to 100 feet on either side, um, you know, I think there's, you know, you go like a mile, 100 feet on either side, that's one thing. You want to go 20, 30 miles of 100 feet clearance type fuel break, that may start to fall out of the, you know, the sniff test so to speak of like, is this considered a minor alteration mm -hmm. to land? Um, another strategy, if I was your consultant, um, maybe to consider it an existing facility 
exemption where you're maintaining an existing facility. So say there was a, an old fuel break out there that you want to maintain um, or, you know, like something within the existing road right of way. Um, that could be another example where then you're not necessarily tied to that minor alteration to land um, definition, um, but you there are some other definitions in CEQA that would require to be adhered to for the existing facility. I think like you can't excite, expand like the scope or the size of it, for example. Um, and then there are still the exceptions of impacts to water courses, impacts to listed species, things like that. So you'd still need to make sure that that's all being considered in your um, potential project. But it's hard, you know, it's hard so to go, go ahead. So if I understand what you're saying, when we're looking at minor alterations, the best way for us to look at that is tying it to structures and make trying to make sure that we're staying pretty much within that 100 feet of existing structures. But that there's something else called existing facilities that might include previous fire breaks. Is that is that what you just said? Yes. Yeah, I've okay. given that guidance before to people. Um, I would also recommend um, if you're, you know, if you want to do maintenance of existing fuel breaks, um, the Cal VTP is a good route if you can find a government agency to take it on um, or to like be the, the project proponent on um, because then that allows for um, uh, maintenance into the future of that those types of projects so if you if you can get funding for maintenance then your sequel analysis is already done you don't have to go through it again um, using the cal vtp whereas if you're just using exemptions you kind of have to go through the whole process every time so i, I want to ask a question about um the idea of minor you know sort of in general being 100 feet on either side of a road or trail or or something for a mile it, wouldn't that be site specific, like depending yeah. on the slope or the soil yeah. or, I mean, you it know, totally would. you get yeah. you have some very major impacts if you remove a hundred feet of understory, assuming it's a shaded fuel break and not a fuel break. I mean, it starts getting pretty complicated in terms of erosion and, you know, soil stability and things like that. hundred feet's a lot in my yeah. mind. Yeah. So, um, let me see, let me go back to the definition. Um, so with the minor alteration to land, um, there are some caveat requirements in there. So I'll just go through them. Um, for the, the, the defensible space, 30 to 100 feet exemption, it says provided that the activities will not result in the taking of listed species um, cause or cause significant erosion and sedimentation of surface waters. Um, so you have to prove that your project is not going to do those things. And that's why I often recommend people get a bio survey out there to like document that you're not going to impact listed species um, and to basically have a professional tell us how it's not going to cause erosion or sedimentation of surface water. So yeah, it definitely is site specific in that Thank case. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it may not even be necessary to do a hundred feet in some cases, depending exactly. on the yeah. slope and some other things. I, I just, I just, uh, I mean, when the, the sort of, prescriptive one size fits all I know that this group isn't like this, but I'm constantly on the alert for people who just go, Oh, I can do a hundred feet and mm -hmm. think about the specifics. Yeah. Thank you. Well, guys, uh, it, it was a wonderful meeting and Robert a terrific <coughs> presentation. And of course you, um, got a lot of good questions and you had good answers. So, and I, I want to also appreciate you for, coming almost every meeting because there is uh, often something that comes up where we could use your counsel. So uh, I really appreciate you and the county for um, allowing you to participate as a member of the forest working group. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you. And to everyone else, unless there's some final uh, must uh, say, <laughs> then we will one. convene at, what was, what's the time for tonight? We wanna see you all tonight at La Rose Restaurant on 4th Street uh, for a celebration of all the things that we just talked about today and all the great things that are now available to us for next year because of, of some of the funding opportunities that um, are coming along. So is there anything someone needs to shout out? 
Yeah, I'll take I'll take one. Uh, maybe someone else has one too. But um, but yeah, D at six o'clock tonight at La Rosa. Um, looking forward to seeing you guys. We'll have some good food and we'll share stories and just have a nice close of the year. Um, but yes, also, so speaking about the um, grant funding opportunities that are coming up and how the working group um, is looking to perpetuate the coordinator position and, and all the work that we're doing together, um, I would love to get testimonials from members about what this group means to you, what, why you come every month, what you get out of it. So I'll be emailing the group, um, but even if I could just get testimonials from the whatever, 12 of us that are here, that would be, you know, gold. So if you have something nice to say, it doesn't have to be long, just a little line about why, why it's worth your time. That would be great. Um, so look for an email from me asking for those. And um, that's all for me. Any, anyone else? Okay. Well, we'll hope to see you tonight. Otherwise, the date of the next meeting, Adriana, is in January and it is... Yes, it's January 20th, Thursday. Okay, all right. Well, you guys uh, take care, stay warm and, and get wet. <laughs> take care. <laughs>